So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa. Please take it away. Hey, thank you, Greg. And hello, everybody. And thanks to PFI for the invite to join you from my farm here in Wisconsin to talk about my favorite topic of diversification and different ways to build our farm businesses through smart strategies that, as I strongly feel and hope you'll see, increase creativity, quality of life, and all those good things as well. So we will be planting seeds during our session of ideas, and I look forward to the Q&A in the end. So um, here's where I am uh, with uh, under two feet of snow, if you could picture that, in Serendipity. This is our five-acre parcel in far southern Wisconsin. We're about a our South and Madison, right over the Illinois state line, have been here now going on 25 years um, and uh, do a bunch of different things. As I will share some of our story and some of other farmers' stories on ways to really create a, both a quality of life, the good life, but also the fiscally good life on the farm through diversification. Now, uh, I understand when, when one is presenting about these topics, one needs to establish credibility with the group, so I will do that. So here's my farming um, background. <clears throat> uh, roughly 1975, I was Laura Ingalls for uh, Halloween, uh, obsessed with Little House on the Prairie and all of that at an early age, as perhaps others had been, but I grew up uh, in a suburb of Chicago. <laughs> no grandma's farm, no nothing like that, no farm roots whatsoever. And then uh, my other qualification here is this painting I did, probably in these same a third grade era of barn and silo for my grammar school art class. My dad's an artist and he just loved this painting and framed it on the wall in the hallway where I was growing up. And I never thought twice about it until like literally 30 years later when I ended up on a farm and said, whoa, you know, I have been looking at this picture or shall we say not really looking at the picture that has been staring at me all my life of my destiny. But Things add up in interesting ways, but I didn't start off on the farm after college. I ended up here, <laughs> uh, literally stuck in Chicago traffic, but also literally stuck a little bit in my own life or an early midlife crisis, as I like to think at 30, uh, where my mom still calls this my brief normal phase of life of having a job and a paycheck <laughs> and a cubicle to go to. Yay. Uh, but early on, both I and my husband, John, Ivan Co realized this wasn't for us. And even though we had been groomed for things other than the farm life, it called us. And we were literally at the time escaping weekends up to Wisconsin, like a lot of Chicago folks do, and just said, hey, let's make a go of this and see what we can do. So this is our acreage here. But the net net is didn't come with a whole lot of experiences, didn't have these kind of virtual conference opportunities to connect with amazing resources and people and ideas. So, uh, so yeah, but the diversification has always been an important part of my story here because, again, we didn't come with that farming background. Oh, we left jobs behind. So there was no income whatsoever, a little bit of savings, but not much, uh, but some big dreams and some big ideas. And uh, that's the story. So what I would like to do in our brief time together is talk about a lot of different ideas. And these will be uh, looked at a perspective of both business ventures, things you can do, how do you manage your expenses throughout that, which is a big important variable in diversification. What I call the ecopreneuring livelihood, and that stems from John and my book, Ecopreneuring, which is a combination of ecology and entrepreneurship, because we don't want to just Earn money, right? We want to we want to change the world through sustainability and through caring for the soil and caring for our communities. How do we bring those broader missions into our business and crafting your good life, whatever that may be for you? For me, as you'll see, it's having these multiple things going on, having that diversity and creativity, and maybe some of the ideas I'll talk about will spark with you, and some won't. But that is all good. So we I will be talking under that philosophy of grandmas that don't put all your eggs in one basket, kids, diversify. Mother Nature, she knows the same thing, right? Don't plant one seed. And I'm gonna add a little caveat here of my own. Uh, let's ignore COVID, if you don't mind, for the first 40 minutes, because a lot of what I'm talking about will, will go beyond COVID. Uh, it's not 
a very good situation right now for some of these businesses, as is pretty obvious. Um, but things are going to change. Things will change. There is light at the end of this pandemic tunnel. So I want to initially share with you more the, the bigger picture, what's beyond this. If folks have questions or anything else, more timely, happy to go into that during the, the Q&A. So why diversification? Why does this work for me, for lots of farmers? Uh, First of all, the, the key income is situations. It's a stronger income base, just like one would manage a stock portfolio. You don't put everything in one stock. Same thing with a diversified business, which really has these financial benefits and pandemic. Yes, a little bit on COVID resilience, which really magnified for me and a lot of farms this last year where, yeah, you know, I did not run the B&B last year. And frankly, we are not opening it up this year due to COVID. You'll see some, some shots in a minute, but it's integrated into our farmhouse. We can't do it safely. That income got sliced, but when there were other things going on, we're okay. We're, we're resilient. We can weather this because of that diversification. Freedom to try out new things, uh, that creative element of ideas, and for us, in family integration, there's my husband, John, our son, Liam, at his earlier age, he's now a teenager who'd probably be irritated if you knew his mother was sharing these pictures. But for us, it's always been important that we as a family run this business and what are elements that we can do together and what are elements that we can involve Liam. And as, at an early age, he was running his own section of the market stands, sometimes making more than we did. But, you know, hey, milk the cute kid factor. So these are some of the reasons diversification has been important to me and my family, and hopefully some resonate with you as well. All right, we're going to move into what I'm calling our idea generator. And if at the end of my presentation, you're feeling a little head buzzy with ideas, great. <laughs> I did my job. I want to throw a lot of ideas out there. And uh, in the handout, um, that PFI organized for you. You'll see different resources and things to follow up on, and I'm happy to answer questions as well. But these are bigger ideas that uh, uh, I want to throw out and, and uh, get you thinking. So farm stays and bed and breakfast we'll talk about. Value-added food products, particularly through cottage food opportunities in your home kitchen, on-farm food service, serving meals, and then a little bit on writing and workshops, that's a big part for me, and a little bit on sustainable research management, which is also under our diversification umbrella. And I'll be sharing some of my stories, stories of friends and farmers in our community here, particularly Della Ends in Broadhead uh, by me, does a lot of the in-home baking and the cottage food stuff uh, that we work on together. Oh, and we sued the state for the right to sell baked goods too, but I'll get back to that. Okay, let's go. Farm stays and bed and breakfast. These are actually the same thing. The words get interchanged. Farm stay is more of a marketing term that you hear a lot of. People want to go on farm stays. They want to spend the night on a farm. Great. But bed and breakfast, B&B, &B, is really the, the legal term, if you will, in, in your state's legislation is what you'll be looking for. So as my mom calls this, when she refers to our bed and breakfast, you mean like strangers come to your house, your farm in the middle of nowhere, and give you money to spend the night and have breakfast. And I'm like, yeah, it's awesome. So the B&B &B has always been a part of our lifestyle and something I just feel really strongly about that it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, it's meeting people. Yes, it's increasing farm viability. It's bringing people on the farm. It has lots of residual effects. So I know we have probably the majority of people here from Iowa, but wonderfully people from all over. So I'll be kind of helping folks navigate what next steps would be, because really everything I'm talking about today will bottom line go to your state's legislation. Your state, wherever you live, will have regulations, laws that will determine what and how you can do things. But basically everything I'm talking about is legal in different capacities. It just, you need to follow your state's rules, bottom line, and find that. So in most states, uh, finding just you're finding your state's bed and breakfast, you can probably get to the original legislation. There might be other resources through extension or a state bed and breakfast association, but you want to see that there'll be some uh, definitions and parameters. For example, here in Wisconsin, we can, you know, there's how many rooms you can have, for example, or how many nights you could be open a year. Typically, there is a state inspection. We get inspected by the state, the Department of Health annually. Usually it's pretty basic, uh, you know, 
the basic safety things that we should be checking anyway. Make sure our fire detectors work. Make sure that the refrigerator is at a certain temperature. The, the key thing behind B&Bs and the beauty of it is we don't typically need anything commercial. So my kitchen is just like your kitchen. And I want to keep it that way. But the point is we can utilize that and tap into this. There may be some rules in your state on what you can serve and, and that. But again, fairly easy to navigate. I wanted to uh, mention Airbnb, though, from the start, because let me clarify, Airbnb, which is great, which is huge, which is more and more used, is a marketing tool. So it's great. You know, you can literally get signed up on there overnight and start getting folks coming over, but it has nothing to do with your state regulations. And that's super important because too often I meet folks like, well, I'm just doing Airbnb. You know, it's, it's small. It's this, it's that. It's not legal or very likely might not be legal. You want to make sure you check that out because unfortunately um, it, it is often overlooked. So to our place here in Serendipity, we're small. We have two rooms. You see the one here. This is our writing room with both John and I doing a lot of uh, writing and authoring books. Our other room is uh, the music room. So very much in those themes of creativity that's important to us, but we're small. Again, just the two rooms. Each one has their own bathroom. Uh, and one thing to think about with your farm stay is expressing yourself and your farm, what it is that's important to you and marketing to attract the right guests. So in this case, we are a, uh, we are a century farm, but we've been renovating using green design and other elements. So that's part of our story and people want to come to see that. We, for example, are very big on the sustainability side. So we don't have air conditioning because you know what? A hundred years ago, they didn't have air conditioning and everybody was fine. And we have a process to keep the rooms cool. We have a fan in the room. If it gets really hot in July, I'll get out the you know, blender and start making iced margaritas, whatever. But uh, the point is we communicate this to guests and we attract the right guests to understand that, hey, if I had units hanging out of the window buzzing loudly, it wouldn't reflect the values that we are communicating. So uh, important to think about. Also, B&B, &B, um, and we go more into this in the ecopreneuring book, anything you have in your home in particular allow you to manage expenses more efficiently. So in our case, 24% of our 1928 farmhouse is used for business. That's the two B&B &B rooms and our home office. What would it take if I rented that square footage in town? That's easy to find out. Then that's a check that uh, our corporation gives to Lisa and John personally for renting that space. Rent is taxed at a different rate than other things. So it makes strategic sense in your business. And I'll just, I'll put a couple of toes into accounting, but not, not, not for everybody with that. But again, our ecopreneuring book goes more into that, but it's important to think about this strategically. So when it comes to expressing yourself, this is our front porch where we serve breakfast. You might see this mural in the background there. Let me get you a better shot. I mentioned my dad was, is an artist and we had this really tacky plastic brick on the wall that we didn't want to take off some board shirt was under it. So we cajoled him into painting over it. So this is what he painted. It's a beautiful birch mural. My dad's uh, Estonian from Estonia. So it's a Casa Salu, which is birch forest in Estonia. And then John had this idea that we needed fairies in the forest. So if you squint and you see on the right, yes, that is a full throttle nude that my 80-year-old father painted as interpretation of fairy and forest. Now, for, fortunately, she doesn't look like my mother, but she's got that like bouffant beehive hairdo. He really thinks that was the epitome of it. So yeah, it's a little strange to be eating breakfast next to a naked lady, one might think, but you know what? It's part of us. It's part of our story. Guests take selfies with her and named her Eve. Okay. So other things to express yourself in your B&B, &B, we do a lot of solar cooking. We run the whole farm actually on renewable energy. That's a big part. Developing your specialties. When we started, I, I didn't want to serve orange juice or some of these things that are expected at breakfast. We don't grow oranges, last I checked in Wisconsin, but we do have a heck of a lot of dairy. So we do smoothies, utilizing local dairy, fruits, frozen fruits from the garden. How can you make this your own? Uh, sharing your passions and values with us. We've done a lot of sustainable green design, retrofits on the farm. We retrofitted a granary with straw bale for greenhouse growing space. Love to give farm tours uh, and share that with other people. Add on sales at your B&B. We do some things like mugs, cookbooks, some craft items, produce. These are all things, again, that add up to your diversification. But be sure to 
market them accordingly. We had a sign in our kitchen that said fresh produce available. We, we obviously give the farm tours. We talk people through the gardens. I think in the first 10 years, we sold about $12.99 in produce sales. It just wasn't clicking until we started with this custom order form that we leave in the B&B rooms of what are things you might want, what, uh, you know, custom harvest, let us know the night before. We also do now baked goods with this as well. And now we're averaging $40, $50 sometimes of orders from guests uh, because we're making it easy. So that's part of something to think about too. Speaking of easy, sometimes we get big dreams in the winter here in the Midwest. A couple of years ago, this was my vision that we should build a labyrinth. Come on, John. Come on, Liam. And I got him to do this with me. We installed it. And as you can see, took a picture of me walking it. This is the first time I had ever walked a labyrinth. And frankly, the last time I had ever walked a labyrinth. And I share this story because sometimes we percolate ideas <laughs> that we want to get out and test fine, but maybe we should think through a little bit more. Uh, it was too much maintenance. It was way too much maintenance to keep this baby up. I had this idea that people would come to the B&B to walk the labyrinth, and that really wasn't a marketing advantage. So a couple years ago, we just let the thing go, let it grow. But because we had worked the soil here so much, the trees popped up like so quickly. And unbeknownst to me, we roughly had, I think, eight hammocks we had collected over the years. So Liam made himself hammock mayor of hammockville we put all these hammocks up where all these trees were where the labyrinth was people use these so much <laughs> so i share the story because sometimes you got to try your ideas they might not work out how you planned if you're not investing a lot of money good things can come out of it sometimes in new ways uh also reflect your quirks and biorhythms play by your own business rules charlene torchier she and her husband came to our b and b when they were researching starting their B&B up by Lake Pepin. And she mentioned to me, well, you know, I'm not a morning person, so we're gonna serve brunch. And here it was, I was like, well, gee, you know, I get up at five every morning and make my muffins because we have to serve breakfast at eight o'clock. And I was like, I don't know if that's gonna work, Charlene. But sure enough, it does, it's great. She communicates it to her guests. She leaves out some coffee. Folks go out for a walk. They come back for a nice brunch more leisurely later in the morning. So. You can create your business around what works for you. All right, moving on. Value-added products under cottage food law. So this, um, again, state-specific laws that allow you to use your home kitchen for producing certain non-hazardous items for public sale. This is fairly new. Most of these laws have happened since 2008 during the last Great Recession. And it's awesome to really be able to do things directly from your home kitchen and not need all the commercial incumbents. So again, state specific laws, your law will let you know what exactly you can make. I put in the handout a, a great resource that Iowa Extension has for your home-based food laws, um, producing home kitchens. And sometimes there's limits on ways you can sell or how much you can sell, but importantly, you need to sell directly to your customers. So four key questions when you're looking at your state's cottage food law is, what you can sell, these are non-hazardous goods. So basically things that are shelf stable do not require refrigeration uh, is the quick way to explain that. Where can you sell your products? Sometimes there might be some restrictions. Can you sell at farmer's markets or only at farmer's markets, et cetera? That's how we are right now for our high acid items in Wisconsin. Um, but bottom line, you have to sell directly to your customer. There are some states that are opening things up for wholesale that's a little more complicated and more regulated, but net-net, you have to sell directly to your customer in your state. How much can you sell? You might have a gross sales cap in your state, but right now over 25 states do not even have a gross sales cap. I, I mentioned, uh, oh, suing our state in Wisconsin for the right to sell cookies. Yes, <laughs> we are a little weird in Wisconsin where we had a law, have a law, that allows high acid foods, but we could not, thanks to politics, get a law expanded to include baked goods. So I was in this situation where I could legally serve you muffins at the bed and breakfast, but it was illegal for me to sell you the same muffins for food safety reasons, which I realize makes no sense. So we, three, uh, two other women farmer friends of mine, Della Enns and Chris Marion with the Institute for Justice sued the state of Wisconsin over the right to sell baked goods. And we won back in 2017. So for any Wisconsin folks, uh, it, it gets a little confusing because we've had a lot of history behind this. 
we don't have a law, but it's perfectly legal to sell your non-hazardous fake goods. And we've seen hundreds, if not thousands of new businesses popping up throughout the state and so many throughout the country now, particularly inspired during the pandemic of things you can do from home. Okay, so here's a quick snapshot of the country. And this is on forager.com, which is kind of a great national portal of cottage food information. You see shades of colors based on how good your law is. And by that, it kind of means like how many different things you can sell, how much you can make. So you can get a quick sense there. If anybody is from New Jersey, you see that gray state. It's the only state that does not currently have a cottage food law. They are desperately working on it, hopefully soon. And look at that big blue state in Wyoming. This is new. These are states that are increasing in number that have what's called food freedom laws that are allowing a whole lot more opportunity, particularly for farmers to do all sorts of other things on your farm. I hope at a future PFI uh, conference, I'll be back and can share about food freedom laws and much more opportunities. But right now, it's pretty limited to a couple of states. But look up Wyoming because they have done a tremendous job with this. So, um, with cottage food law, there's a opportunity to really expand and diversify throughout the year. So uh, again, things like winter markets, particularly if you're doing canned items or baked items or basically anything that's not fresh produce, it's an opportunity to do that. Also CSA add-ons of offering a bread share, a cookie share, a cupcake share. The world needs that now. Uh, easy ways to diversify off your farm businesses. So some resources under cottage food, and these are all in your handout under the homemadeforsale.com, the book site. So this is the book John and I wrote a couple years ago. We're coming out with a second edition next year I'm excited about because there's been such growth and such a movement in this cottage food world. So that's kind of a national guide for getting started, marketing, business setup, product development, et cetera. And then I just finished up two uh, Udemy class on cottage food because, again, there's a lot to it and not a lot of resources. So that um, you can look up on the website too. There's a discount code link. And then a couple of SARE farmer rancher projects with your central SARE that you can also get to from the website is a labeling toolkit. So this helps you create canned items. So if you're bringing your pickles to market, how can they look like they just came off the shelf at Williams and Sonoma looking professional, reflecting the food artisan you are, labeling, product design, that toolkit goes into that. And then there's another new project, uh, farm, uh, Farmstead Bakery Recipes and Resources. So the, you see the team of my women farmer friends here in Southern Wisconsin that, that did this, that came out last spring. So if you go on this website, again, it'll link from the homemade for sale. There are uh, a lot of recipes that have been tested that you can use for your cottage food sales. Sometimes if you're using produce like zucchini or pumpkin, Things can be a little suspect on the non-hazardous scale because there's a lot of water content in those items. But we, or you, have developed recipes that meet the water activity criteria. I'm getting into the science weeds. We don't need to go into that. But bottom line is there's a database of recipes on this site that have been tested and are non-hazardous and safe. There's also a section on Farmstead Bakery on packaging. So if you're bringing your dozen zucchini muffins to the market, they don't look like the Boy Scout bake sale, please don't use saran wrap. It doesn't sell. But tell you what, we figured out, like if you take those 12 zucchini muffins and you put a little frosting on them and you package them cutely in individual packaging, and we have resource lists on the website, they all of a sudden become cupcakes and presents and your price per unit and most importantly, your profit per unit can really increase. So there's resources there as well as display ideas for um, how to uh, create attractive farmer market displays for your baked goods. Um, and lastly, and I'm really excited about this, is because of this movement and interest in cottage food, both farmers but uh, folks in all sorts of life situations across the country, is we, with Renewing the Countryside, a Minnesota-based nonprofit, are organizing the first National Cottage Food Conference in April of this year. You can, again, get information off the website or register, and we'll get you more info when that goes live in about a month or so. So this will be the first time we've gathered cottage food entrepreneurs across the country for idea sharing and resources, and really looking forward to it. So... So lots of resources under the cottage food bit. 
And I wanted to move on to a little bit on commercial, because this is often of interest for folks of building a commercial kitchen. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> we are talking dollars now and money. Uh, so do it strategically and think things through. And hopefully with some of the other resources I'll talk about for on-farm food service, don't necessarily jump there immediately unless you know your market and you have your customer base. Now, Cottage Food really provides an easy on-ramp training wheels, if you will, to test product ideas before you write that check, go into debt, whatever it may be, for commercial production. And Dorothy Stainbrook is a great example. She's an organic berry farmer in Minnesota. And she, at the time, her daughter was in high school and was on the swim team. And her daughter was eating a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And Dorothy was buying jams and jellies and said to herself, wait a minute, I'm a berry farmer. I can make jam and jelly. And so she starts making jam and jelly. And she starts selling at the Minnesota markets under Minnesota's cottage food law. But Dorothy in her other life was a bartender. And she starts mixing interesting things. And who knew like Merlot goes so well with blueberries, right? So she makes a really good product and people are interested in it. And she, at the time, exceeds the Minnesota gross sales cap. So she's got to go commercial. For a while, she was renting and uh, that worked okay, except she was schlepping everything to the offsite kitchen and she wanted to be on the farm. So she ended up building an on-farm commercial kitchen. There's a case study story of her in the homemade for sale book. That was about 50,000, but she had a market and she's growing tremendously since then. Has won all sorts of food awards and things and credits the fact that she could start small, test her market in her home kitchen without taking on debt before she um, took the big commercial plunge. Other options for commercial operations are rentals. So incubator kitchens, if you are closer to a metro area, this is Seed Kitchen here in Madison. They are, best case scenario, if you can find like one that's run by a nonprofit that's really there to support food entrepreneurs. There's typically some kind of hourly rental fee, but a lot of resources to help you get started. It's often a barrier for like folks like myself who are two hours from a place like this, but something to think about, again, a way to test your ideas without going into debt. All right, moving on to on-farm food service. So up until now, everything we've been talking about is a product. So I make pickles under Wisconsin Pickle Bill, and I sell those at market. If I crack that jar open and put it on a stick and sold it to you, or you know, being in Wisconsin, fry it first and sell it to you, that is food service. That is ready to eat food. Totally different category. Typically, products are regulated by the Department of Ag, your cottage food law will fall under that. But once you just go into food service, it's the same as a restaurant. It's uh, regulated by the Department of Health. Now, typically, and I totally get, you know, people want on-farm dining experiences. They're hot, right? Farm to table at its finest. If we were in a, a in-person situation and we're talking about this and I asked you, well, why do you want to have on-farm meals? You, most likely folks would say things like, well, I want to bring families on the farm. I want them to experience the whole farm to table. Wonderful things, building community, right? All of these great goals. Have a potluck. <laughs> Have a potluck because that will get you to those goals much more cost effectively than anything else we'll talk about here. But obviously it's not it's not part of your business mix per se, but there's no reason when we have potlucks, for example, which you see a picture here, we do all the time. I'll have my farmer's market stand out. I'll have my, my, my uh, pickles for sale, et cetera. You can still make it part of the business venue. But once we get into people paying for food, paying for prepared food, paying you for a meal, it gets more complicated. But let's talk through some options. Now, a great resource here with Renewing the Countryside is a manual that I, fortunately, thanks to the virtual world, was able to post the whole PDF into your handout. Um, come and get it, what you need to know to serve food on your farm. So I think the latest edition is 70 pages of more information on this. It is, the, there's a general section to start with, and then there are specific chapters for uh, regulations in Minnesota and Wisconsin. We're hoping to see this expanded. They are different where you live, but even if you're, if you read those, you'll get a general sense. And yes, it is complicated. It's something to be thinking about strategically. One thing I also put in the handouts that we did, um, obviously pre-COVID, but I hope you find it interesting, is there's, there's a research report on 
people attending these on-farm food service events. So we compiled data over the course of a summer, and you'll see there what it means to be a consumer, which in designing your business, you want to know, like, what are people looking for? Where are they coming from? How do they hear about it? So you'll see that research data as well. All right, let's talk about some basic options. One easy option is to partner with a restaurant or event planner or a chef so that they would be using their commercial kitchen offsite. Lower time commitment, you won't be investing in a kitchen. It's a way to test this idea without the, the again, um, taking on the debt. So they would have all the licensing. It'd be the same as working with a caterer. Sure, you can work with them to um, uh, use your produce, use you know what you have on the farm, work out a menu and all that. And uh, that's a good way to get, to get your feet wet, see if this even works for you. Another option is to utilize a local commercial kitchen. So in this case, uh, Marianne and Mark Bellazzini at Campo de Bella, they were intrigued by the idea of farm to table. They um, rented, in this case, their parish kitchen. Some church kitchens are licensed commercial, some aren't, they really do vary, but in this case it was. And they basically brought their produce there. So they were the caterer, but they were on site doing the dinner in the church parish. And they, um, it was, again, a smart idea to test out their idea before taking on the bigger project. And not surprisingly, I guess, they, 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 they did like it. They liked it a lot. They found out it worked. This was their big new thing. Up until then, they had been a vegetable CSA, but having some kind of cafe, they're Italian. We want to make wine as well. Let's do it. And then this is what they opened, Campo de Bello Winery. So this is a full-scale it's a new building on the farm. It's a full-scale commercial kitchen. There's cafe space. There's the winery. It costs over 200 grand, and this is their baby. And it's, on one level, too, shifting them from the farm. This is what they do now, which is something to think about in on-farm food service because it takes time. It takes time. So these pizza farms we'll talk about in a second. And is that what you want? And is that what you want to shift from the, the farm? So I want to talk a little bit about these pizza nights because they are – popular and wonderful and who doesn't want to come to a beautiful farm setting for pizza generally and I'm, again these are your state specific laws but i want to talk a little bit about kind of the why behind this is pizza so these are farms that serve pizza typically one night a year one night a year one night a week uh during the summer months they typically only do pizza and it serves takeout style so this isn't a restaurant per se which does help a little bit in the regulations if you're only making one thing. When you call the health department and you say, hey, I'm gonna make pizza, they get it. You know, oh, that's hot. That comes out of an 800 degree oven. It's eaten right away. Yeah, that's pretty safe on the food skirt versus the, I don't know what I'm gonna make next week. How can I know? And then you're a restaurant for all practical purposes. And that's obviously got a price tag behind it. So, um, the, the places I have pictures of here are case studies in that come and get it guide. So you can read more about their experiences. So you do need a commercial kitchen set up, but this is the uh, kitchen at Stony Acres in Wisconsin that does a big pizza night. And this is the kitchen they started with. You know, it, it, it's pretty basic. <laughs> they had done a renovation on a main barn and then could add space for the commercial kitchen. So there was efficiency there too. Scouting used equipment. They got most of the kitchen equipment for about 5,000. So there are ways to do this. Um, but again, in this kitchen, basically they're making pizza. The problem or challenge, shall we say, with some of this is labor intensive. It takes a lot of hands on deck, a lot of staff, a lot of employees to pull these off. Exceptionally weather dependent when this Sky is beautiful, you'll have people. When it's raining, you won't. And that's hard to predict, and that's hard to pre prepare for. Um, but also, too, under diversification, there's ways to increase your income as far as offering a market stand, especially if people are standing in line for your pizza. A lot of times, smartly, these farms do their pizza nights the night before they go to market, so everything is harvested. But talk about a crazy 48 hours if you're going from this to the market all day. As you'll see in the research uh, report I was talking about, these venues are exceptionally family friendly. Families love them and ways to reflect your passion and other businesses too. Dream Acres there is a pizza farm in Southern Minnesota that has a strong theatrical background. So you go there, there's performances, there's kids serving pizza on, on stilts and all kinds of fun things. All right, uh, moving on to writing and workshops. So this is basically 
sharing what you know, sharing what's in your brain, sharing what's in your, your experience as an income source through teaching of workshops. So you may want to check here if there are any sort of regulations or zoning issues where you live with most of us being rural, you know, it, it usually is not an issue, especially if you're not doing something large scale constantly. We do like pop up workshops. You see me there. This is uh, in our cantina area, which is an old hog shed. That's basically a roof talking about big surprise, cottage food <laughs> and getting folks food businesses started. So I do those intermittently over the course of the summer. But again, a way to both teach what you know and also market your farm in that, as you see, um, uh, felting workshops, fiber workshops, if you have fiber to sell, if you have sheep to sell, all those things together can add up into a stronger income package for you. On the writing side, so I have uh, for years done a variety of writing, both authoring the books, but also a lot of freelance writing, particularly in the sustainable small farming realm, particularly actually featuring and working with a lot of women and profiling those stories. So these are some of the publications that I write for. Um, but that said, <laughs> let, me, let me be blunt. The, 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 the paid writing world has really, particularly now under COVID, really fizzled in the sense of old school journalism where you're hired to write an article and you're paid for your research and your time and the product the good note is things have expanded with blogging opportunities and other ways to really get your writing out there. But as far as a paid activities, if you can find paid outlets, terrific. But what I found even more so is that writing can fit into your farm diversification mix. So whenever you are writing about your farm, about your experiences, you are inherently marketing your farm business. So that is, again, part of your legitimate business mix. When there are expenses that you need to use to that, et cetera, they're all part of that and can often be something, as I'll talk about in a second, tangible that you can sell at the end. So when I'm talking about expenses, for example, you need to produce. That's what you know, the IRS needs to see, right? You spent X on these supplies. What did you produce on it? So, so let me talk about how I can buy my friends drinks. So <laughs> on those um, potlucks that we have, uh, I'm always experimenting in the cocktail department, right? Uh, Pre-COVID, post-COVID, especially post-COVID, I'm ready. So these were some uh, seasonal sangrias I was doing. Must have been a fall potluck. There's apples in there, right? So what did I need? I needed, I needed some vodka. I needed some other elements that I'm not growing on the farm. I have those receipts as part of my business mix. Now, if I was just serving them at a party, yeah, that'd be too great for me. But I did a blog post on it. Fall harvest fruit sangria celebration in canning jars. At the time, this was for hobby farms. Now I write more for Mother Earth News. They're always looking for bloggers, farmer bloggers, homestead bloggers. They don't pay but they have good outreach because you're writing with another portal. And again, this can prove what I did, what I produced. I keep records of all of these as to why I expensed vodka. But <laughs> um, anyway, you can do it however you want. But my point is that this can fit into your farm diversification mix nicely. On the product note, so cookbooks, think about producing your own cookbook because recipes are what bring the food together, right? And I'm sure you have tons of them already. We had a lot of them when we started the B&B &B and people were asking for my zucchini feta pancake recipe. And I would, this is a little old school back then, I would take the greasy piece of paper, stained piece of paper and put it through the fax machine and give them a copy of that and started thinking we can do better than this. But the idea of a cookbook just seemed too overwhelming until one winter like we have now, I said, okay, I can type one recipe a day. And sure enough, by the spring, we had a working manuscript. This was the first cookbook that we did. Very homespun. It was a spiral bound uh, cookbook. We had it printed locally. You see our son is a co-author. My dad did the sketches. My mother-in-law did the watercolors. My mom proofread it after the fact. So there's a couple little handwritten notes in there. Very homespun, but we sold it for 10, 12 bucks. And then that, because we had the base, led to our eventual published cookbook with New Society Farmstead Chef. So again, small steps, taking things step by step can really add up to final product. Lastly, I want to just quickly touch on sustainable resource management because this often gets overlooked in the diversification mix. We've been talking up until this point about diversification as a smart business strategy and as an income source, but the less income we need, the 
less we need to earn, right? So on that note, I mentioned we run the farm on renewable energy. Yes, there were investments in the systems, but that's part of our diversification strategy where now we get a check back because we overproduce from our utility. So some of these ways to creatively reuse can help a lot to uh, have a good quality of life, bottom line, and add to that uh, income mix. Also, too, just want to throw out of the sustainable resource management, how you're managing other resources on your farm can uh, also be um, a part of your farm income. We have some forest that we do um, manage forest on and do uh, sales off of that or you know, other, other things as well. Terrific. So I hope. People's heads are buzzing a little bit with ideas and uh, questions and all of that. And this really all adds up into how we as individuals, I as Lisa, you as you, define your good life. And for some folks, and maybe you've already left the Zoom room of this is you, we, we want good life like this, very orderly and tidy and things are, you know, flowing and neat and predictable. And that's great. That's great if that's where you're at. For me, and as you might have gotten a sense from <laughs> what I've been talking about, I'm a little bit more of the crazy quilt. You know, I like having different ideas. I like having opportunity to be creative and try out new things, express myself, which does add up into a little bit more <laughs> of um, uh, an interesting situation, I would call it, but still strategic in that they're all part of my life quilt. They're all part of my business story. They all add up to the bottom line, especially now when we need to be resilient more than ever as we come out of the pandemic. And um, yeah, it's something that has really fueled me over now the last two decades. So on that note, let's move to questions or anything else you'd like uh, clarifications on. I'm gonna out of my PowerPoint and yeah. stop sharing and hopefully you see me and hopefully I see yeah. folks and questions. We see, I believe we see you. Um, we do have a couple of questions that popped up as you were chatting. Um, one of them around, what are the rules around serving and preparing breakfast? I know you kind of touched on that, um, but mm -hmm. and I assume they vary from state to state as well. Exactly, they vary from state to state. In Wisconsin, we're probably on the more um, accommodating end. So as I mentioned, there's a state inspection, but I really can serve pretty much whatever I want for breakfast. So, you know, we, we have uh, those zucchini feta pancakes or anything along those lines. It's only breakfast. That is really the key with mm. bed and breakfast. It sounds obviously in the title. And I know folks can come up with all kinds of creative, well, can I do dinner for a donation? No. No, no. But that said, um, we can do anything we want for if we give it away for free. So that is a little bit of flexibility. So, you know, when folks come, I usually have a little bit of a appetizers or snacks or something like that. I don't advertise it. I don't charge for it per se, but it adds to people's overall experiences. So your state may be a little different. Sometimes there are different levels of what you can serve. Occasionally I've seen where you can only serve like prepackaged food. So you're buying it from another source. Those are rare. And if you do bump into that, I would definitely like talk to your local representative about getting some of these changed because that is definitely not what we're about as farm fresh farm stays. Yeah, for sure. Now, where, where would you, what office state office would you recommend um, the, to go to in trying to figure out those state laws? Yeah. So, so for all the Iowa folks, I actually was looking for this resource for you. And if you Google it, you'll find a how to start a bed and breakfast in Iowa via Iowa extension. And you'll see this label across it that says not available out of print, which would make me think <laughs> you might have some new regulations in Iowa, but it's, it's typically the health department. So usually through the health department, some states are honestly better than others. It will um, tell you what you need to do, you know, and be pretty clearly outlined. Um, you could, your local extension usually can help you find that too, as well as, um, um, if there's a state association, sometimes there's a, you know, Iowa association of bed and breakfast owners, which typically the net is much wider there than farms. Um, you know, you've got everybody under there, but, uh, you should be able to, to find that. Now that's it to circle back to Airbnb. 
Um, because clearly <laughs> Airbnb is bringing money to states and rural areas. So let me clarify a little bit on my caveat earlier. Please, yes, do not ju just do Airbnb and think you're okay because you're not, but do research it because there are states like Wisconsin, for example, where in the B&B legislation, it says I have to go through an inspection if I rent 10 nights or more. They might have a minimum on it. In Pennsylvania, oddly enough, the minimum is the same as the number of home state games at Penn State. You see where this is going. There are situations where you need lodging and states need to accommodate. So there may be a small number uh, which kind of could qualify for some Airbnbs, except Airbnb is so transparent, you can easily look at somebody's site and be like, they had more than 10 nights for sure. There might be something like that. Um, and there might be increasingly, as we move forward, more accommodating laws for Airbnb startups. What happens is, um, or has happened, shall I say, is states lose money. So if you have under the radar operations under Airbnb and the host is taking money, but the state never gets their sales tax, their tourism tax, ka-ching, 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 you see? So what's happening now, Wisconsin was one of these states in recent years where the state and Airbnb broker a deal. So for example, if you book Airbnb in Wisconsin, the, um, I'm sorry, is my camera on? Um, your ca uh, it, it may be frozen. Maybe turn it oh, off okay. and turn it back on, <laughs> it might help. <laughs> All right. Sorry. <laughs> I just saw black. Not that you need to see my smiling face, but um, uh, anyways, um, I don't know why that's not working, but I will continue. Um, so uh, what happened in Wisconsin and that's happened in a lot of states now is the state and Airbnb broker deal. So if you book a Airbnb lodging in Wisconsin, the tax portion immediately goes to the state. So you as a host never have to deal with it. But most importantly, from the state's perspective, they get it. So there's just interesting things happening because it's all good. It's all getting people out and traveling, especially it's going to be more reasonable and doable during um, post-COVID. So, uh, so, so look into it. But uh, the important part is please look into it. Yeah, I think that's the important part. Um, One thing I want to mention on that note, too, because, oh, sorry, the regs is, I, I'm talking about bed and breakfasts, which are rooms in your residence that you rent out and serve breakfast. There are a lot of other forms of lodging that would have their own regulation. So camping, for example, is typically a different regulation. Uh, even And it doesn't matter. Camping is a good example. Folks might have heard about glamping, where you... Um, you know, upscale camping, right? Fancy tents, all of that sort of thing. Platform tents. They're still, they're still, they're still, um, they're still glamping. <laughs> um, they're still, sorry, they still fall under the camping regulation. There's also, if you had a separate uh, building on your property that you were renting out as a cabin rental, that is typically a tourist rental. So different kinds of rentals, different kinds of requirements, but um, you should be able to, to navigate based on what you have or what you want to do. Yeah, for sure. And even zoning too, as well. I think that depends on how, how your local area views what you're doing. Totally, Greg. And uh, on that note, now that the whole pizza farms, wedding barns, those sort of things are much more popular, there's been a lot of backlash on them of uh, situations that yeah, you know, if people are bringing three, 400 people to a farm every weekend, there's there's noise factors, there's parking factors, there's all kinds of things that are popping up that, uh, you know, may, may be a barrier or maybe an opportunity, but um, the, and especially if you're doing something like that, zoning is important. Fantastic. Another question here, how do fermented foods, how are those categorized? Yeah. And this might be a state by state thing as well. Oh, uh, most likely not. In okay. that fermented foods are considered, those are commercial is the quick way to say that. Everything I was talking about cottage food would need to be canned. So I sell sauerkraut, but for those who know, uh, I lose all of the fermented properties when I can it. So um, yeah, those, those would require commercial licensing and kitchen. Fantastic. 
And let's see, I, a couple of resources that people are sharing. Um, hipcamp.com is a place for advertising um, of host camping and then um, checking out, uh, talking with your county health department as well uh, was something that Susan had recommended. But I'm not seeing any Perfect. more questions. So if people have questions, please share those um, in the, the comment box on the session page there. Great. And Lisa, I guess a question for me, um, how, so can you talk a little bit about that decision-making process of when you are deciding to, so you've brought many different um, kind of enterprises onto your, your operation. What kind of decision-making process did you go through to kind of decide that? Because I love how you kind of, you really focused on starting small and then expanding it, but how did, what was going through your head as you're you're thinking through that? Yeah, yeah, no, you nailed it, Craig. I mean, for us, a key variable is starting small without debt. You know, the minimal investment, and then you can test ideas and see if they work. To you, see if they stick. So that that was one driving consideration. For us, we really enjoy the hosting aspect. The whole B and B side is really a uh, lifestyle and things that bring people onto the farm have always been of, of interest. So, um, and the thing of it too, is you can, um, you can scale up, you can scale down. So as I mentioned, we, we have scaled down during COVID with the B and B when Liam was little, those first couple of years we scaled down, but, uh, you can scale back up too. So they're very, um, flexible. Cottage food is a great example too, where, you can do as much or as little as you want. Uh, so for us, the small and manageable is really key. And that can be a, a, I don't call it a barrier, but it's just something to think about because for us, we've intentionally kept all of our enterprises small and manageable. So we don't have staff. We still like doing it after 20 years. That's me. <laughs> you know, you may be in a different situation. But I mentioned like the pizza nights because those can get to be a real challenge for farms. And if you go in the come and get it guide, you can, you can read some of this in the case studies where there are situations where farms are grossing more on their pizza night than their CSA. And that can be almost a, a moral challenge for some farms in the sense of if you're a farm where your value is, is serving your community with fresh food, you know, but you're making all your money on, 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 you know, hipster urbanites coming down for a night on the farm. Plus it's a lot of work and it's a lot of draining. So th those are just tough ones when something grows to the point that you need to really evaluate it in context of your farm. And that, it may be great for you. You know, you may be at a stage where you're ready to transition out of the CSA, like the Bellazzini's at Campo de Bello were and go full force into a new venture, but it's, um, it can be a challenge. Yeah. Uh, Maggie asked, would you, would cooking workshops require a commercial license? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the gray zone. Um, it, I, I, it, it, I don't know in the sense of, put it this way. If you called your health department and asked that question, they would probably say yes. Um, but the yes would come primarily because food equals eating, right? And eating requires a commercial kitchen. Um, personally, I have done, you know, various cooking workshops here, but I don't advertise them as eating or a meal, you know, or something you see those where it's like, you know, we're going to gather vegetables and make a farm fresh brunch. Yeah, that would, that would make it really great. Um, so, so I'm sorry, I'm not really answering your question other than, yeah, probably, uh, but here's where having good relationships with your local agency staff goes a long way. And this is where the come and get it guide. We were intending to give farmers information. So, you know, you never want to call the health department without doing your own research. Do you know? Because, I mean, agency folks tend to get a really bad rap, especially the health department. Right. You know, I mean, but we got to look at it from the lens of their lens that their their job is to protect public health. Their job has nothing to do with helping our farms succeed. I don't mean that 
negatively, but it's just what it is. So work with them on that, you know, and when you call them, don't say like, hey, I'm thinking about doing, um, you know, brunches and this, well, you know, da, 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 da. <laughs> that will <laughs> a suck their time and be not get you where you want to go. You know, if you call and say, hey, I'm looking at doing a pizza night, we're going to be serving 20 nights a week, just pizza, it's coming hot out of an 800 degree oven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've done your homework. Trust me, that will go a whole lot longer. The other thing is if there's anybody in your area who's doing the same thing, ideally in your county, hey, we're going to, you know, do um, some pop-up dinners just like so-and-so did. Oh, okay. There's a box that you can fit into. Um, but uh, so, so with the, you know, question of like a cooking workshop, that might be a little bit more zoning, honestly, too. But even then, if you're like, hey, you know, I'm going to do a, a how to make bread demonstration two times a year you know, that kind of thing. Um, be specific. And that I think will go a long way. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, a couple of questions around prairie and flowers. Um, do you do anything with the prairie and do you sell um, or use your cut flowers in any way? Oh yeah. <laughs> I got to backtrack. <laughs> that picture I showed you was an intern we had a couple of years ago who had a cut flower CSA. So that is uh, Morningstar Gardens' glorious work there. Um, we do have some flowers, but more, more, more pop-up bouquets for B and B guests who would like some to take home. So, uh, no, no, we, we primarily focus on the vegetables. Fantastic. Well, I think this is a great question to move us out of the workshop. Um, what is next for your farm? Oh. It's a well-timed question. We've been asking that ourselves. <laughs> um, this is this is just my my personal take on it. Under COVID, is I'm fine waiting until things get back to. I hate using the word normal, but you know, a situation that I had to, back to 2019, where I could have guests on the farm and hug them and hang around at campfires and all of that. That's not going to be this year. You know, it's just not. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I'm okay with that. Our family's okay with that. You know, I don't want to do things piecemeal. So we're focused on other things. We've been upping the the vegetable sales. We've been doing more. We we obviously our couple of restaurants we don't have anymore. But we've been doing like like custom CSAs uh, in the sense that there's some folks in town that have specific dietary needs. Um, so we've been doing that. Uh, I've been working much more in this cottage food space, as you, you probably got from my obsession in talking about it and working on this conference. I just think we've got a lot of opportunity to support that home-based food artisan community. So I'm not actually, if, if you look up any of these cottage food things, I mean, they are, these are primarily women. I mean, actually more than 80% of the businesses are women-led. Amazing cake and cookie decorators. I mean, talk about food artisans, which is not, not my area at all, but I am... Um, uh, I'm intrigued by all of that. And I got to write the second edition to the homemade for sale book. So that's going to, that's going to take my time this winter and keep me out of trouble. <laughs> that sounds like a, a good task for some quiet alone time. All right. Well, we have reached the end of our hour here and Lisa, I appreciate um, you coming on and sharing this. It's uh, one of those kind of thankful for virtual because we we're able to bring you in and not have weather hold you back. 